All right, thanks all for coming. Redwood has been one of the most iconic trees for the last 150 years. Yet during that time, there's only been a handful of studies that looked in real detail at the biomass, leaf area, and carbon in these forests. Why? Because they're ridiculously hard to measure. For one thing, the trees are so big compared to humans that we're down among the root systems when we're trying to wrap a tape. The trees are not round at that point. The six foot person is down in the root system of these things. Also, they're sprouters, and they, they often make these castles, these big groups. Here's a, a young castle in Big Basin that has more than 20 stems that are tagged. So you have to go up and get your tape wrapped or something else. Also, their crown structure, because they live on the coast, they get damaged. But because they have really amazing heartwood decay resistance, they regrow that crown. So how do you quantify that? Here's some examples of redwood, old redwoods. And you get every kind of crown structure. How are you going to try and predict that just from standing on the ground? And lastly, because of their decay resistance, the logs persist for centuries. And they're very difficult to measure also. So what we did is we wanted to quantify what these tallest and largest forests in the world actually have, and we wanted to do it throughout the range. Here's a precipitation map that is cut out only for the part where redwood lives. And we have rainforests up in the north of Arcata. And it gets particularly continuously drier as you go south. And there's a very, very strong correlation with latitude and precipitation. In the far north, redwoods occupy pretty much all geomorphic landscape positions. So in these sections, we put a lowland and an upland plot. This is a LIDAR map of Jed, part of Jed Smith where you can see crowns, very tall crowns growing on ridges and in valleys. South of the rainforest portion, like in Rockefeller Forest, the really tall trees are limited to the floodplains. We have this irregularly scaled color map here, where blue and black represents everything below 70 meters, which is basically most of the forests in the world. We wanted to focus on these, these taller sections. But once you get south of the rainforest, once you go up slopes, the, Canopy height drops quickly, and the redwood component drops quickly. A lot of this is from a paper that just came out last month, where we talk about all kinds of aspects of old redwoods. But today, I'm not going to talk about light or leaves. I'm going to just talk about how we get these carbon numbers. What we did is, because the horizontal diversity is the final structural developmental portion of forests, especially conifer forests, we wanted to have at least three tree heights in our plots. So these plots were based on a center line that was more than 300 meters long or over 1,000 feet long. We quantified or subsampled all aspects of the vegetation, even right down to the bryophytes, to, to assess this. Now, we had to make several deviations from what most people do when they measure plots. I've been working with permanent plots since the 80s. And uh, our protocols are a little bit more detailed. One thing that we quickly realized when we first started was some of our early work was in Douglas fir and uh, mountain ash in Tasmania. And we realized that the growth potential of these trees is closely tied to the leaf area and the cambium surface area. Now it turns out those are two of the most difficult things you can ever possibly measure at the stand level. But we did anyway. One thing we discovered is the top of the buttress is the best place to get a measurement for redwood. I know this is a very difficult thing to do with old trees, but it turns out um, it's one of the best predictors. And DBH 
in most of our work is called FDBH, which is the functional diameter, not the actual tape route, but a corrected. I'll show you that in a minute. So a lot of times we have to use ropes to collect DTB, unless you have someone like Ethan who can just go up there and do it anyway. To quantify the shapes of these lower trees, um, granted it's a fairly small area, but it's the biggest part of the tree and it's almost always really irregular. So to get the cambium surface area, you gotta know what the shape of that is and you gotta know how thick the bark is. One method we've used pretty successfully at this, this is a giant sequoia, but we wrap the tapes around it. We know exactly what the tape reads and their exact heights. Take a whole bunch of photos of it. And then use the software, there's a number of them. I use one written by a guy at the University of Washington, where it looks for commonalities between the photos, just like your phone does. But instead of stitching them together, it figures out where the cameras were located. And it creates a point cloud that's extremely detailed. These point clouds off in the train have two and three million points. And the mesh that's created from them is sub-centimeter. So we can use these to cut the tree at different heights and build a model. Here's an example of a giant sequoia with a big fire cave. And you add these up until the tree's round. And then our tape measurements take over from there. Now you have the shape of the tree. We core the tree for um, a number of reasons, but one of the things we get from these cores is we get the bark thickness and the sapwood thickness. And we also do this at ground level. So then we can rebuild the tree with its components of bark and sapwood and heartwood all the way up. Now we can model the shapes of these trees in their different components. And some of these things are ridiculous. These castles are amazing. This is a 10 meter grid here. And some of these formations are just odd and very big, so they take a lot of work to quantify. Here are six stem maps from the rainforest part of the region. These are 316 meters long by 32 meters wide. Basically, it's one hectare that's 10 times wider than long. And this gives us that horizontal variability. One thing you notice is there's a lot of dead wood. Our five southern sites, from Humboldt Redwoods all the way down to Big Sur, you can um, see that there's quite a bit less wood. So to, to try and estimate biomass and leaf area using allometrics, it's a risky thing because um, the tendency is people to use equations on their data set and a lot of times the data used to create the equation came from trees or plants that were smaller. And I've seen this personally a lot of times where if you go beyond the data that was used to make the equation, things can go ballistic really quickly. So we basically had to start over and we created new equations for all these things listed here, which are all the main players in our plots. And it does include the, the endpoints for each one of these equations. We've been doing this for a long time, and last year this paper came out on the tree level study of the redwood and giant sequoia. Now for the redwood, we had a total of 97 trees. 55 of these, these first two rows, every single branch was mapped in three dimensions, and the leaf area was quantified. The additional trees down here were used in a third level regression to help us get to those endpoints. This includes the tallest, largest, and oldest known redwoods. Now among those 55 trees that were branch mapped, this is what the point cloud looks like. Now to get biomass and leaf area at the whole tree level, you got to sample this point cloud here adequately. So what we did is we cut down 160 branches. And because we had the inventory, 100% inventory first, this is a very robust data set and it was basically the minimum amount of, of destructive sampling to achieve the goals we wanted. Some of these branches are very large. 
And, but our crew is also very large, so we here is we're dissecting a giant sequoia branch. We dissected at one centimeter intervals, so that and at each stain the bark thickness and sapwood heartwood, heartwood thickness is measured. So at, even at the branch level, we can talk about cambium surface area. It turns out that these giant redwoods, half of the surface area of the bark is in things smaller than this. Half of the entire surface area, which is hectares, is smaller than this. So the branches is where a lot of studies don't quite get to the, the be able to predict the whole tree. Here's an example of our salmonberry data set. We measure these two, the basal diameter and the height slash length. Those are the predictors. And these are all the measurements that we can predict. The, these are the actual samples we collected, and then we make a regression for each one of these. For example, here's a red huckleberry one, where we're predicting foliage mass, green bark mass. A lot of these things have green photosynthetic bark at the ends, cambium surface area, bark mass, and wood mass. So this is a pretty good regression, and this is what we used. I tried some previously written equations for huckleberries, and we have huckleberries that are over 20 centimeters and probably 400 years old. So these equations from other places weren't adequate. So here's one of our endpoint trees, almost half a gigagram in a single tree. This is more than a lot of hectares of forests in other, in other places. But the bark surface area is almost a hectare. And a lot of that is in the, the small branches. So for coast redwood, we end up able to predict all these things to a very high level of accuracy based on diameter at the top of buttress, the functional diameter, and for all the things that have to do with leaves, crown volume became the best predictor. We used crown radii, we rose crown depth, but crown volume, which integrates all that stuff was, those other ones fell out of the regression. So now for old growth redwoods, we can predict whole tree biomass very accurately with just these simple measurements. Now, one of the most difficult things to do is rot, especially in the, inside the tree where you can't see it. It's very impractical to scan trees that are that big or core them to look for that. But fortunately, in the old days, this guy Kimmy was off there on three papers that used over 500 old growth trees when they were being dissected for the lumber mill and examined them for rot. And he found that um, fire caves or other basal wounds were the highest concentration of rot. Uh, broken tops were also a source of rot. But um, one third of the trees they sampled didn't have any rot in them. So for the, so what we did, and he also found that the, the most common rot, there's very few rots that get redwood. I mean, that's why they live forever. But the brown cubicle rot, Corius koi, grows throughout the range of the species. That's the most common one. But up in the rainforest, you get this white rot that um, is kind of famous on western red cedar. And in the stands where they share, um, this rot is also very important. And you can see that as you go north, this rot becomes more important than even the brown rot. But in the south, it basically is non-existent because there's no cedars, I think, to keep it there. So anyway, what we did is wounds were doubled and given a decay four. That's very rotten. Same with the broken tops. A five times one paraboloid was removed to a lower density. And then trees were now outward signs were given a column of decay as they got bigger. Also, with downed wood, we did the same thing. And then downed wood, the classification for downed wood is a five-point class, five classification that we adjusted because it's based on the pine family. 
and we got these wood densities. We collected a whole bunch of rotten redwood and measured them. This is a plot. This is a closed canopy plot up in Jed Smith, and look at all that wood. It makes you think that these trees are falling over constantly. But this plot has huge redwoods in it. It's just that the logs are hundreds of years old. There's very few um, newly fallen redwoods in that, in that picture there. So anyway, our total grand story is we got the wettest place where redwoods live is the heaviest forest on Earth. And I color coded this. This includes the deadwood. The red and that red are heartwood. So two thirds of all that mass is heartwood. And the other thing to notice, bark. Redwood bark protects the trees. They spend a lot of energy on that. There's more bark mass in all of these forests than all other species combined, except that big basin where there's some big dug firs. <laughs> We used uh, published or our own carbon estimates. They're mostly around 50% to come up with these numbers here. Two and a half gigagrams of carbon per hectare. The highest other forest is one we're just about to publish on, which is giant sequoia, which is 1.5 gigagrams. And then the Tasmanian forests are a bit lower and the Douglas fir forests up north. Now, the reason I think the redwood is the world record is because of this heartwood. They all get complex structures, but none of these other forests from the Pacific Northwest achieve the dimensions of the coast redwoods. Fifteen years ago, I wrote this book, which features the largest trees on the West Coast. Here's the sixth largest, three from the cedar family and three from the pine family. Fifteen years later, look at all these dead ones. Even though they're big and huge and awesome, they rot. They don't live as long. And we've only had minor damage in the redwoods, and that's how come they get their weird structure anyway, because of minor damage. So yeah, we're actively working on uh, adding a giant sequoia to this list, because it's breaking a lot of records. It's the only fire forest in the world that really accumulates that amount. And this was a lot of work, but we had a huge group of people, here's my co-authors, and this small army of people helped collect all this data. So, thank you. This one? I didn't quite hear you. I already passed it? One more. There you go. Okay. These are upland and lowland sites in Jed Smith. Um, they're deep in there away from all the trails. They're just, um, we wanted these, this is the wettest place where redwoods live, so we wanted to capture that. The uh, Redwood National Park ones are also uh, deep into the forest. Um, one of them is really hard to get to. It's a couple kilometers of bushwhacking just to get there. <laughs> Smithsonian, Smithsonian Strides, Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. They have a bunch of plots throughout the world, and they're often, um, their objectives are different. For example, a 50 hectare plot is what they usually put in. This is one hectare. And the 50 hectare plot can have, in one hectare, can have 600 species of tree. So their objective was about the species diversity. Their trees are short, and they're pretty easy to measure. So what we have is structural diversity. They have species diversity. 
So it's different though, but on those big giant tropical emergent trees with the plank buttresses, they use ladders and things to get up to the DTB measurement. So they do use that. Thank you.